Hey there, guys. All right, today we are back with some more of the Great War onto week 146. <clears throat> what the fuck? <clears throat> ah, I'm dying. The Mac Macedonian. <laughs> I was about to say Macedonian. Well, that is also one way to say it. The Macedonian, but the American way, the way I learned how to say it. The Macedonian standoff. The five nation army is repelled after sitting in Greece for what? Two years now? Have they been in there since 2015? I mean, not 2015, 1915. God, if they, oh my God. Have they really been in there since 1915? I'm trying to remember. And that sounds right. Dude, poor Greece, man. Greece is just getting fucked. And they didn't even want this. They were going to sit out of it, most likely. Well, they may have joined the Central Powers, but honestly... I don't know. I don't think they would have if... I don't think they would have... I lean towards that they probably wouldn't have done anything. Um, uh, they probably wouldn't have joined the Central Powers uh, or the war in general had the Allies stayed out of them. Uh, if anything, they probably could have been convinced to join the Central Powers if in exchange they get some land from like Albania and Serbia, because obviously Bulgaria is not going to give up this land. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't see Greece just got fucked. <laughs> Before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love if you join the Discord and follow me over at Twitch. Okay, by the time this goes live, no, it is when I'm recording this. This is it is July eighth. <laughs> Get you a. Little hint as to how far ahead I sometimes pre record videos. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, like, I, I will be playing Baldur's Gate 3, though, when it comes out August 3rd on PC. I've had it in my library, and my Steam library, since they released it in early access all the way back in 2020. Anyways, enough rambling. Let's dive in. When the Western Front became a stalemate in 1914, the Allies began looking for new places further and further. Oh my god, yeah, they have been in there since 1915 at the latest. They were probably in there by 1914. A field to try and break through. From Gallipoli to Palestine to the Tigris River, they'd had high hopes, but to no avail. And more high hopes come crashing down this week as Russian, French, British, Italian, and Serbian forces, the Five Nation Army, fail in Macedonia. Dun, dun, dun. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week, French Army Chief of Staff Robert Nivelle was fired because of French disasters in the field and replaced by Philippe Pétain. The British ended the week with a huge disaster of their own in the field, but prepared for more attacks. The Russians, their army crippled by desertions and mutinous behavior, still vow to continue the war. Indeed, the war continued everywhere, and one such place was the Macedonian Front. The Allied plan this week against the Bulgarians and Germans was for the Italians and French, with a Russian infantry brigade, to attack at Cherna Ben. The Serbs would attack in their sector, and the British would attack east of the Vardar. In fact, General Maurice Sarail, in overall command, planned a frontal assault on the whole length of the enemy lines by the French and Italians, which his commanders were pretty skeptical about. I mean, we've seen before how... daunting the Bulgarian defensive system was, possibly the best on any front. And they had the heights with dozens of searchlights blazing down on the Allies in battle. They were also God backed damn. by German heavy artillery and Austrian howitzers. Still, on the 5th, 91 French and Italian artillery batteries opened up on the enemy. The bombardment lasted for four days, but did not significantly damage the enemy's defenses. At 6.30 a.m. on May 9th, the French, Italian, and Russian infantry attacked. It was a failure. During the assault, the Bulgarians took just under 700 oh. casualties. Add the thousand or so they'd taken in the barrage, and that's 1,700-ish. 
Now, I don't know the German figures there, but they may be a bit higher since they were in the thick of the fighting. But the Allies took 5,450 casualties Ooh. and gained absolutely nothing. Sarail was Ooh. not deterred by this and tried another attack the 11th. It, too, was a failure. The second Serbian army went into action the 9th, and that attack stalled after taking its first few objectives. But then the Serbs were stuck under a withering counter-artillery attack. French and British big guns helped out a bit, but they couldn't get much further. As for the British attack, that was the renewal of the Battle of Doiron, which began a couple of weeks ago. The British launched an artillery barrage and then an assault on the evening of the 8th. But by the following day, they were forced to abandon the attacks because of heavy casualties. Fog and smoke caused confusion. Telephone lines were cut by shell fire. Their infantry were hit by their own artillery. It was a mess of confusion. Since the battle began in April, they had lost over 12,000 men killed, wounded, or captured, while Vladimir Vasov's Bulgarians had lost just one-sixth of that, and half of those from disease, not battle. As for the first Serbian army, Sarail asked for action and got delayed. They said that until the heights had fallen to the second army, the first was too vulnerable. Then the Serbs asked Sarail to stop the whole campaign. All of these defeats and lack of progress, combined with the French failure to advance at Monastir, meant that for the course of the whole spring offensive, the Allies had lost tens of thousands of men in total and had taken basically nothing. There would be another attack next week on the Struma River, and the Irish division there would take its objectives after barely firing a shot, but huh. Sorrell would call off the entire offensive, having achieved nothing except turning living men into dead ones. Of course, War. this was overshadowed by the recent colossal French failure at the Chemin de Dom, so he didn't have to worry about his job at this point. The French were actually attacking again on the Western Front this week. That attack had begun the night of the 4th, continued on the 5th, and managed to take Creon and the edge of the California Plateau, but could not cross the Alette River. Another attack a few days later took Vauclair and La Faux Mill. Actually, on the 5th, the attacks were in cooperation with the British, and they took the crest of the- Oh, the British and French, they're cooperating? They, are they actually synchronizing in time this time? Or is it gonna be another where one of them attacks and then the other gets delayed, vice versa? That's been happening a lot. The Crayon Ridge and 6,000 prisoners. And further north, the British were trying again at Bulcor, as they had last week. First, they held off a German counterattack on the 6th, then mounted their own attack on the 7th, gaining a foothold in the ruins of the village. Over the next few days, they were shelled continuously and attacked with flamethrowers, and though the battle wouldn't officially end until next week, it was, for all intents and purposes, over. The British had taken tens of thousands of casualties for a minute portion of the Hindenburg Line. By this time, General Edmund Allenby, commanding the Third Army, was warning Commander-in-Chief Sir Douglas Haig that the reserves, now being sent into battle, were semi-trained troops, unable to use their rifles properly. Also at this point... Well, you've killed all the others. Point, ...twice as many British as Germans were being killed in the offensives. The British were up to 4,000 casualties per day. So on the 10th, in the House of Commons... Per day? I know that's an average over the course of the war, I'm assuming. Or is that just an average for right now? God damn. Commons, Winston Churchill, pointing out... Never that heard American of troops wouldn't be ready until next year, said... Is it not obvious that we ought not to squander the remaining armies of France and Britain in precipitate offensives before the American power begins to be felt on the battlefield? He received no answer. There would be more offensives. You know, again, as I said before, the idea of Gallipoli isn't a bad one. There was just poor communication, the British not taking advantage of certain situations, and of course also the British, I don't think, uh, the British just weren't, um, they didn't put uh, enough planning and effort into Gallipoli for it to, like, they needed to take some more time on Gallipoli, um, really get the logistics prepped out in advance, They're like, alright, this is how we're gonna keep them supplied, this is how we're gonna push in blah, 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 you know, keep the troops moving. Um, 
Gallipoli is not a bad idea. It only gets shit on because it failed, which, you know, fair enough. If a plan fails and it doesn't achieve anything and you lose thousands of men, that idea probably should be shit on. But, like, would we call... If Normandy had failed, we'd be shitting on that one, too. But you look at Normandy, that was the best plan you could really come up with. Honestly, I I don't see any other better uh, <laughs> idea than uh, Normandy uh, for the Allied forces. That was the best chance that they had at, uh, at landing. Uh, now, of course, they were making some gains through Italy, uh, southern Italy, by, by mid-1944, but you know, and the Russians were pushing back on the Eastern Front. But, you know, it still needed to open up another front to take off more pressure so that the war can be over, ended over faster. Um, it's just, you know, right, like, essentially Normandy and Gallipoli were the same ideas? Roughly? Now, of course, Normandy had the uh, fortune of having a lot more material at hand, um, more a lot more troops at hand, a wider beach landing zone, um, and also newer technology, right? Planes uh, and stuff. Um, but I, again, I don't think Gallipoli was a bad idea. Okay, I'm walking here. Uh, I have my problems with this Winston Churchill. I've said him before, um, but. From his ideas, and especially what he said in that quote there, he he he's a good uh, general. He's a good commander of uh, uh, of people. I mean, of course, he can inspire. He's very good at uh, inspiring people. He's very good at speaking, um, and being just a leader in general. Um, but his tactical ideas, they're also, you know. I don't know if I'd call them outstanding ideas, but compared to the people around him at the time, he's fucking smart. Prime Minister David Lloyd George, unlike the military, saw no reason to attempt offensives before the Americans arrived, and he pushed for a new Italian offensive. He was really putting a lot of faith in the importance of the American army. I mean, when the U.S. declared war, for a while, it wasn't even certain they would send any men and would send only supplies and money. Congress did pass a bill last week to raise 500,000 men, but the U.S. Army didn't even have divisions. Its biggest unit was the regiment. So the U.S. began putting together a first division to dispatch to France, even though it hadn't been trained for combat and was too small to make a difference. It and the rest of the American Expeditionary Force would, from May 10th, be under the command of General John J. Pershing. Seeing as how I've mentioned the Italian front, I will look there for a moment. It's been quiet for pretty much the last six months, but that's about to change. Now, both sides had really built up their forces over the winter. The Italian forces had nearly doubled, and their artillery was up to 2,200 big guns, including British and French heavy pieces. On the other side, Austro-Hungarian commander Svetosar Barojevich von Vojna was still way outnumbered, but he too beefed up his numbers and now had 1,400 big guns. As usual, his engineers had been busy rebuilding fortifications and protecting machine gun posts, fortifying trenches and shelters, and building additional defensive lines. I wonder how many of these, how many of the people in this picture are dead. Well, obviously by now, all of them are dead. <laughs> But what I mean is how many of them die in the war? If I had to take a No, I'm not going to take guesses. Uh, this one. I think this guy might have seen the end of it. This guy probably died. That one too. That one, uh, severe shell shock post-war. The rest, also dead. The Italians would soon attack. That's my guess. The plan was straightforward. The Tenth Battle of the Asanzo would be in two flanks. First, the army of Gorizia would attack on the northern flank, trying to break through to the Bayensitsa Plateau. Italian Army Chief of Staff Luigi Cadorna hoped that this would lead Borojevich to move... Cadorna... 
defend to the north, and then the Italian Third Army would attack to the south, across the Carso Plateau towards Trieste. Borojevic's problem was that he didn't know when the Italians would attack, since they were now much better. I'm sure the Italians don't even know when they're going to attack. Fuck Cadorna. <laughs> better at camouflage and hiding their movements. The attack was set for the beginning of May, but heavy rains delayed it again and again. It would happen soon. And something interesting happened in early May at sea. A convoy of merchant ships guarded by destroyers sailed from Gibraltar to Britain without a single loss to a German submarine. The convoy system had been dismissed earlier as useless, but after this, the British Admiralty began looking into it seriously. They had to do something, having lost nearly 900,000 tons of shipping in April alone, 50% more than what Germany believed was needed monthly to drive Britain out of the war. And that's the end of the week. The Allies unable to break through in Macedonia, the Allies unable to break through in the West, and the Allies planning for a breakthrough in Northern Italy. Well, at least they're still planning for one somewhere. It's hard to know just what the generals in the West were thinking about the Macedonian front, but I know that it was a side note or a footnote to many of them. It couldn't be that hard. I mean, the Bulgarians? Can they fight the five-nation army? How many times do we see this? The smaller or lesser nations that are supposed to be easy pickings and never are? Remember when the Germans were joking about just sending the police to arrest the British army back in 1914? Yeah, they don't do that anymore. See, it turns out every nation can learn to be great at modern war. If you'd like to learn more... And that was the Macedonian standoff. The Five Nation Army is repelled. The Great War Week 146. I've got nothing to add here at the end. This was mainly a episode on just ongoing battles. Nothing really happening. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.